Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to the ninth annual Wild Wisconsin Winter Web Conference. I am Jean Anderson the, with the South Central Library System, and I am moderating the small, or excuse me, I'm moderating the management track. Assisting me today is Ann Hamlin from the Wisconsin Valley Library Service, and we are so glad that you are here. Our presenters for this session are Katrina Vernon, Ann Burlingame, and Sarah Lyon from the Wake County Public Library System. They will be presenting on decreasing barriers to library use. So Sarah, whenever you are ready, go ahead and take it away. Thank you so much. Good afternoon, everybody, and welcome to Decreasing Barriers to Library Use with Wake County Public Libraries. We're located in Central North Carolina. Over the last eight years, WCPL has made decreasing barriers a priority in our strategic and tactical planning. In February of 2020, we delivered this presentation at PLA in Nashville to a room of almost 1,000 librarians. Uh, and it's crazy now to think about being with that many people in one place at the same time. As soon as we returned home, life and library service as we knew it rapidly changed. It's important to acknowledge that in present times, all libraries have a whole new set of challenges and barriers to overcome. We'll outline the common barriers as outlined in our initial presentation and provide a methodology for participants to identify and develop solutions to their own barriers. We'll also touch on the innovations we've introduced in the past year to meet our customers at their current level of comfort in this new world. Before we begin the presentation and define our learning outcomes, I'll take a moment to introduce the panel. Um, as we go on, if you have questions, we invite you to submit those in the chat box, and at the end, we will certainly make time to answer any questions. So I'll start with our uh, Deputy Director, Ann Berlingame. She oversees operations and programming for the library system. Katrina Vernon is our Senior Library Manager for Facilities and Operations, and she manages development of policy, oversight of data and statistical analysis and daily operations of all 23 of our library facilities. And I'm Sarah Lyon, Senior Library Manager for Experience. I oversee youth services programming for the system and manage the development of programs and services to underserved populations. Thank you. Next slide. Okay, thanks everyone for having us today. This is Katrina. And I just wanted to share with you the learning outcomes um, for this presentation. We want to identify potential barriers to library use in your community, find and develop solutions to barriers, and consider alternative policies, operations, and programming initiatives that may decrease barriers. Additionally, we want to provide you with a methodology to manage this process. We're going to talk about what we did and the steps we took to achieve it in hopes that you can replicate this process at your own libraries. We don't expect your results and your library's needs to be the same as ours were, but we hope that the approach that we took to decreasing barriers within the Wake County Public Library System will be beneficial to you. Now to really get us started, I'm gonna pass this over to Anne. Thanks, Katrina. So um, what I'm gonna do today is give you an overview of some barriers to library access. And then as uh, Katrina said, she and Sarah will talk to you about some of the things that we've done in Wake County to um, deal with those barriers. So we'll just begin with um, talking about the main barriers to library services as identified in library literature. And much of the information that I'm sharing came from uh, a study completed by the Edmonton Public Library in Alberta, Canada, titled the top five barriers to library access and recommendations for eliminating those barriers so we'll begin with what is a barrier and really a barrier is just something that limits access it can be a physical barrier it can be operational programmatic or as sarah alluded to a pandemic all of these can limit access to a library there are five common barriers uh, to library access. Next slide. And those are um, barriers related to policies, fees, accessibility, literacies, and awareness. So those five we talked about in Nashville at our presentation are, are all included in the Edmonton study. As Sarah alluded to, we have added the COVID-19 because that in itself has become a big barrier and 
So um, we wanted to kind of talk a little about what we've done uh, to address that. All right, next slide. So the first uh, thing I'm gonna talk about is policies. You know, policies are the most prevalent barrier that impact underserved populations. Uh, and this is for a multiple of reasons. One, it can be the actual policy content. It can be policy enforcement, communication, policy communication, and policy understanding. There are two main um, areas around policy that are um, confusing to those underserved populations. Next. So they are policies related to borrowing materials and policies relating to membership. In terms of borrowing materials, you know, the underserved populations are really not at all familiar with the concept of borrowing books or borrowing materials. They're unfamiliar with a checkout policy. They're confused, you know, with the whole idea of what's a checkout period, and then you throw in renewals and then you throw in grace periods. So all of that can be really intimidating to populations that don't regularly use the library. The other is membership. You know, underserved um, populations are really impacted by understanding what they need to get a library card. You know, is there a residence requirement? For instance, in Wake County, if you live in Wake County, you can use our library free, but if you don't, you have to pay a membership fee. Do you need a picture ID? Um, then what's interesting is in libraries, I think we're always trying to create different types of cards to ease use, but to uh, someone unfamiliar to libraries, that can be very confusing, whether you know you are you have a patron card, you have an out-of-county card, you have a card just for computers, you have a self-registration card that you use for E, you have a card for children. So all of these can lead to um, being very confusing. The next slide. The next uh, barrier truly it relates to fees. You know, one of the main reasons underserved populations don't use a library or fear the library is fees. Fees can be intimidating, confusing. Um, often there may, there may be a lack of understanding about how a fee is enforced. You know, there's that fear of owing money that you don't have. Um, distinguishing between a late fee, a lost item fee, a fee for a damaged book, you know, fees for service, what fees are negotiable, what fees aren't. Next slide. And the two main fees that really do um, cause uh, confusion are those related to late fees and membership fees. So again, with late fees, you know, uh, there is this concern about accruing fees on borrowed materials. Um, not knowing if there's any flexibility around paying fees, or even being embarrassed by the idea that you owe money to the library. Uh, membership fees, you know, those can be very daunting, whether they're associated with non-residency, you know, understanding how does one qualify for free access, or a difficulty understanding what services are free and what services may require a fee. So all of this makes the library less appealing to populations struggling socioeconomically and also not familiar with public library service. Next slide. The next barrier is really accessibility. It's that difficulty that, difficulty that underserved populations have getting to the library. And there are three main areas. Next slide and they revolve around transportation, distance, and operating hours. So with transportation, really it's the lack of transportation which may impact seniors, it may impact low-income populations, teens. You know, if you're depending on public transportation, you have two schedules you have to manage, you know, the library's schedule as well as the bus schedule. Um, distance, uh, that can be a significant barrier. Um, the distance of the library from where you live, where you work, it can really be daunting. And then operating hours. You know, the hours a library is open often do not align with the times underserved populations want to use the library. You know, often these populations may have six hour workday, work weeks. Um, they may only be available on Sundays. 
There's also, you know, an inconsistency of the hours from library branch to library branch in a system, you know, whereas a big library may be open seven days a week, but the library that you go to is only open five days a week. So that can lead to a lot of confusion. Next slide. The next um, barrier really um, revolves around literacies. And, you know, libraries are institutions of literacy, from reading to information to digital literacy. And there are really two main areas that um, negatively impact those uh, populations that don't regularly use the library. Next slide. They are social stigma and intimidation. So social stigma really is an underserved populations aren't always proficient in the literacies and therefore often embarrassed to use the library. There's also sometimes the um, language that we use in libraries that we're so comfortable with, but can often be um, intimidating to someone new to the library, like just ask them at the circulation desk. They'll have the information at the reference information desk. Those, those um, words and language can, be, uh, can, be, can really make a population uncomfortable if they don't know what you mean. And intimidation, really, you know, libraries are staffed with a very highly educated staff. You know, we, the librarians all have master's degrees. You know, um, library associates and library assistants generally have bachelor's degrees or um, associate's degrees. And that can be intimidating to users who struggle with literacy. Um, the research tells us that really uh, people who struggle with any type of literacy can see the library as kind of an intimidating place, which is truly a tragedy because, you know, as libraries, we provide support and help in conquering illiteracy, uh, whether it relates to reading proficiency, information, or digital. Um, and I think in, you know, our library system, what you'll hear more about is we have really tried to work on ways to deal with, you know, um, some of these uh, deficiencies in literacies and to support those populations. Next slide. And, um, you know, the final barrier really revolves around awareness, who we are and what we do. So libraries are very local institutions. Really the only commonality that we all have is we all generally do um, offer a book collection. Um, and library off, libraries offerings are um, impacted by, you know, the library's organization. Is it one main library or is it a large system, um, a suburban system? Um, by library funding, you know, do you have, are you part of county government or are you more of a 501c3 that depends on, you know, funds from the city or county? The other thing is that, um, it's the perceptions that people have of what the library is. Next slide. Often, you know, the perception of what your library offers in terms of services and programs really is based on the last library you visited, um, the last your library you went to as a child, or even how the library is presented on um, television and the media. It's just, all of them, all of the libraries are so different. It's just hard to make people aware of what your li your library can offer them. So um, our challenge truly is making people aware of what the library has to offer. So these five areas are common barriers to accessing your public library. So the next challenge is really determining the barriers that may be eliminating access in your own system. So what we did um, is looked at, as um, Katrina talked about, a methodology for identifying our barriers. And it was really a three-step process. And so what I wanna do is talk about the first two steps, and then I'm gonna turn this over to um, Katrina. So um, step one is really, we had to define um, what were our priorities for success. Um, and we had to think about how these priorities had to reflect our county and our library system. The service priorities that we identified were closely aligned with, with our large county and with our library system structure. 
So let me just tell you first a little about Wake County and Wake County Public Libraries. So Wake County is a large county. It's 861 square miles. Um, we serve probably over 1.1 million residents. We have 12 municipalities in Wake County, and, and Wake County is the sole, has sole responsibility for library service. Every day we add about 100, pe 100 people to Wake County. Um, half of these are babies. We have a highly educated and diverse community. Um, we're fortunate because people in our community love their library. So every bond, refer every bond referendum we've passed has passed by more than 70%. You know, we are decentralized. Uh, we made that decision in 1982 when um, the county took responsibility for library service. Our libraries range in size from 5,000 square feet to 36,000 square feet. But this, this structure gave us a roadmap for how we define our success and helped us identify the barriers that may threaten that success. Next slide. So we have in White County Public Libraries what we call our tactical plan. And in that we have defined our service priorities and they fall in really three main areas. So really what this is, is it tells us what's important to us as a library system. And the first you know, area we look at is experiences, and we want experiences that are pleasant. So our mission is in to instill the love of reading and foster the pursuit of knowledge. All our libraries must reflect this mission, and although our system covers 861 square miles, consistency and experience is a priority. So whether you're using a library that's 5,000 square feet in a small town or 36,000 square feet in Raleigh, we want our customers to have a consistent experience. We don't want service to vary from library to library. That doesn't mean that there, we do have offerings maybe at a bigger library that we don't have as frequently at a smaller library, but overall, we want the experience a person has to be consistent. The next thing that we think about is we want facilities that are well thought out. So our libraries aren't fancy. You know, we don't have big, uh, we don't have a big downtown library. We don't have a, a monument to library service. You know, we build libraries to serve the many. And, um, we want them to be attractive and inviting, welcoming, very accessible, and importantly, we need them to be very durable because they get a lot of use, and we want whatever we pick out to put in our libraries, we want it to look good, but we also want it to last. The next um, thing that we think about is products that people love, and we offer a popular book collection that people want to read. Um, we buy multiple copies of popular items. We buy multiple copies of children's books. We really want people to be able to get what they want um, as quickly as possible. We offer technology. We want it to be easy to use and very accessible. Um, Wi-Fi, public computers, a mobile app. And we offer lots of programming for children. Children, children are... Um, there's a number of children in Wake County, and we don't want people not to uh, to miss out. So we make our programs as uh, accessible as we can, and, and we offer them an, a lot. Um, so once we determined these priorities, we wanted to look at what barriers could threaten these priorities. Next slide. Next slide. And. Um, Really, when we looked at experiences that are pleasant, we we really did feel that uh, policies and fees were potential a potential barrier to pleasant experiences. You know, complicated policies and multiple fees can make someone's uh, time in the library less pleasant, and it is um, and make unserved underserved populations not feel welcome. With accessibility, that was a potential barrier for us with facilities that are well thought out. You know, a decentralized system will enhance accessibility, 
but we're always thinking about what can we do to make our library easier to use. Literacies and awareness were um, really part of that products that people love um, and they can be a potential barrier. Um, we want people to feel comfortable and welcomed. Um, we think about how can we support populations who may feel intimidated by the library and what can we do to support them and what can we do to make people more aware of what we're doing as Wake County Public Library in terms of services, programs, and collections. So those were our first two steps. Now the third step was, um, next slide, the gap analysis and um, performing the gap analysis and Katrina is going to take it over from here. Katrina. Thank you. Um, so gap analysis. Some of you may have done one of these before. To others, this might be a totally new concept. So I just want to start with what a gap analysis is. Um, a gap analysis is an examination and assessment of your current performance to identify the differences between your current state and where you'd like to be. So to do this, you can boil that down into a few questions. Where are we now? Where do we wish we were? And how are we going to close that gap? So in Wake County, we use data, we use information from our staff, and information from the customers to perform this step. So now what we're going to do is jump into how Wake County approached um, each of these barriers by applying our methodologies to it. So I'm going to lump these first um, two barriers together. And the reason we group policies and fees together for Wake County is because for our library system, both of these barriers impact the experience of our library members. And this just shows you a reminder of the definition of each of those barriers. Um, now we use Wake County government policies as often as we can. This gives us the support of the overarching county and it ensures consistency. Recognizing that policies can be a barrier to use, we regularly review our library policies every year. We receive questions, comments, and concerns from the public, both through our annual customer satisfaction survey, through the patrons' comments to our staff, and through our online portal that allows members to send us questions directly. Through these venues, we review questions and see those that come up the most regularly that may reflect areas that are barriers to our users. We've made some recent changes in response to some of the feedback that we were receiving through these different venues. For the last 10 or so years, we have had a two week checkout period. This began during the recession when we were able to buy fewer books and needed to make sure that books were available for all of our patrons. This is no longer our reality and our book budget has increased over time. We realized that by extending our checkout period to three weeks, we could better meet the needs of our users without negatively impacting others' experiences. By giving this extra time, our hope is that patrons will check out more books, knowing that they have the time to read them. Auto renewal was similar. Although we have had a policy that allowed a large number of renewals as long as the book was not requested, we required our patrons to initiate this, often resulting in overdue items and fees, even though the book was eligible for renewal. By enabling auto renewal, we have eased this burden and made the library more convenient to our users. Lastly, we have eased library card registration to allow Wake County residents the ability to use our online resources and to request physical books before they come into the library to sign up for a card. This new policy is especially useful to parents of school age and high school children who may need access to resources quickly but do not have the means or ability to easily go to one of our facilities. And I just wanted to make a note about those um, self-registered cards and easing library card registration. Um, that was a very timely decision when we enabled that policy about one year ago because it's been incredibly beneficial to our citizens during the pandemic. This slide shows you the difference between self-registered accounts pre-pandemic, so 2019, um, and then in 2020. The number of self-registered cards created in 2020 was an increase of 252%. These policies all have an impact on how convenient the library system is to use. In a modern climate where people can have items delivered to their doors within hours of ordering them, inconvenience can be a huge barrier to library use. During the pandemic and our library's closure 
of our buildings, we've had to continue to review and show flexibility with our policies. We have further eased our library card registration to give more access to our materials from home and pushed out due dates of materials to encourage patrons to not return their books while our buildings were closed. So then the second part of this policies and fees barrier, of course, is fees. So WCPL has always kept the fine structure very low and we encouraged leniency from staff. So you can see here what our um, fine structure used to be, which was 10 cents per day per item with a maximum fine of $2 per item and a uh, $10 per account limit that we charged. We didn't think of the $10 maximum as being high. When we began to do some research on the topic though, we realized we were wrong and that our fines and fees, however low we thought they were, have an impact on the underserved. Pew Research Study defines anyone who lives on $2 or less daily as poor. In the United States, one in 50 people live on $2 or less daily. This map that I've just pulled up um, is a map of Wake County. This is a vulnerability index. This shows Wake County and it highlights communities that suffer hardships. The more red an area, the higher the levels of unemployment, age dependency, low educational attainment, housing vacancy, and poverty. The second map on the right that I've just pulled up shows census block groups with the highest average long overdue fees per inactive library card. So areas that are in any shade of red on that map on the right have an average balance of at least $5.70 on their library cards. Looking at these two maps together shows us that Wake County has higher concentrations of inactive cards with high balances in our most vulnerable communities. So this was really a red flag to us when we saw these two maps next to each other. We also reviewed library data to determine whether a relationship exists between median household incomes and the average long overdue fees for late and long overdue materials. We found a significant relationship between the average long overdue fees of inactive cardholders and the following demographic characteristics at the census block group level. Median household income, average household income, per capita income, and poverty status. The scatter plot helps illustrate this relationship. Um, and what it shows us is, this, is that as the median household income decrease, the average balance on inactive cards increase. So what did all this research do? Um, it helped us make the determination to discontinue the practice of charging fines on materials that had been returned late. Our goal with our new late fee free policy, which launched in January of last year, was to welcome people back to the library who may have stopped using us and to introduce what the library has to those who have never used us for fear of accruing fees. Although the pandemic has made it challenging for us to see the impact of this policy on our key metrics, both initial checkouts and door count were up immediately after we launched this policy. We're looking forward to seeing the ongoing impact of these changes. Okay, I'm gonna move into the next barrier, which is accessibility. Um, people have difficulty getting to the library during operating hours. And we have worked on the issue of accessibility, both operationally and also programmatically. So Wake County Public Libraries has a regional library system, which means we don't have a main or a downtown library. We're a decentralized system that places libraries where people live, shop, and work. We have stayed committed to this plan for growth and the last four bond referendums resulted in more libraries in more communities. When we're considering locations for our libraries, we think about bus routes, parking, and how far our libraries are from the areas where people live. As the system has grown, we've continued our commitment to this regional system. We maintain 10 minute drive times um, and most of our libraries are on bus routes. So approximately 90% approximately of Wake County residents are with a 10 minute drive time of one of our libraries. Each of these colored areas on this map that is around a um, three letter code shows you the 10 minute drive time from that library, which is the dot. So you can see there's a few areas that we do still need um, to increase our libraries in, but we are covering the majority of the population within Wake County. 
Another thing we consider within accessibility is our operating hours. Limited and inconsistent hours prevent families from visiting the library. For many years, we had three different operating hour structures until 2008 when Mike Waslick became our library director. And his main goal after weathering the economic downturn was to get the hours that we had lost returned and to expand library service in all libraries to evenings and also to seven days a week. More hours provide more opportunity for patrons to visit our libraries. Um, and this was not just a one year budget request. The last three budgets, budget cycles, we worked to not just normalize, but also increase hours across the board. And as of September of 2019, 20 of our 22 libraries were open, 70 hours each week with the same schedules. In this year's budget, however, our operating hours have been reduced as a result of the financial impact that COVID has played. We had to make difficult decisions about how to reduce to 60 hours of operation at each location instead of 70. As we made those reductions, maintaining seven days a week service and offering evening hours remained a priority. Frequency of programs is also important. Um, it's difficult to close a literacy gap if your patrons can't make it to a library programming program. Offering more programs provides more opportunities to visit the library. If you miss toddler story time one day, there will be another opportunity the next day. Until we closed our doors last March due to COVID, we offered 200 children's story times per week, 35 school age programs per month, a weekly teen experience at each location, and numerous drop-in and appointment-based programs for adults. You can see this steady progression over time. This is a change that we were able to make without a budget request. And now to talk more about programming, I'm gonna turn this over to Sarah. Thank you. The fourth barrier to library access is literacies, and we have identified programming as an avenue to address this barrier. Gaps can form in all different types of literacies, and as Anne mentioned earlier, these gaps can create social stigmas and a feeling of intimidation, which might prevent someone from visiting their public library. Wake County Public Libraries is committed to removing barriers by offering programs and services that address specific gaps in literacies, early literacy, information literacy, and digital literacy. We consider the needs of our community when developing programs in order to create accessible points of entry at every age and stage. And in doing so, we hope to meet our patrons where they are. Next slide. The majority of our programs serve the traditional library user. However, using data supported by the Wake County Vulnerability Index Katrina mentioned previously, we identified areas of Wake County that could benefit from more from their public library. Over the last four years, we've developed an initiative, Every Family Ready to Achieve, or EFRA, as a program series focused on shoring up literacy gaps in underserved communities. We began with a focus on the young child and expanded to school age, teens, young adults, and adults. And I'll briefly walk through these programs to illustrate what this looked like in a pre-COVID world, indicating modifications we've made to offer some of these during the pandemic. Next slide. So before I move into the programs, I just wanted to identify the 10 libraries uh, in Wake County that currently support every family ready to achieve. Again, we took a look at that vulnerability index, overlaid it with our map of libraries and identified 10 libraries um, in these different areas of Wake County uh, that we could really have uh, an additional impact. Next slide. So all 200 weekly story times in our libraries are based on PLA's Every Child Ready to Read, and we focus on talking, singing, reading, writing, and playing. Many young children in underserved communities enter kindergarten without the benefit of attending preschool. And our EFRA enhancement is a pre-kindergarten experience called ABC Craft and Learn, simulating a preschool classroom visit to address potential gaps uh, in early and information literacy. Children are able to participate in a circle time, listen to a read aloud, and then answer questions. And the program also includes a simple craft. Cutting, coloring, and gluing all work on the fine motor skills that children need to develop their writing muscles. We're currently exploring an on-the-go version of this experience to meet patrons' needs during the pandemic. Next slide. Our programs for school-aged children focus on educational success. Weekly programs for children in kindergarten through fifth grade emphasize reading, creating, exploring, and discovering with the goal of reinforcing what's learned in school. The EFRA enhancement to this menu of programs is Books with Brian, 
Brian is a blue dog and he's our library mascot and we found he was the perfect representative for this program where children can read to a therapy dog. This activity helps them to work on fluency, vocabulary, and other reading skills. Dogs are excellent listeners and never judge, which destigmatizes the experience for participants. And while children are waiting their turn, we offer interactive games and toys with a focus on promoting the development of literacy skills. Next slide. Moving into the teen years, our focus is helping them develop leadership and life skills. And at EFRA locations, we offer a program series called Life Hacks at the Library, designed to equip teens with the skills they need to transition to a successful future. Each program in the series focuses on a topic related to interpersonal skills, independent living skills, and physical and emotional wellness. Next slide. Our newest area of focus can be intimidating from an information literacy perspective, getting ready for college. In September of 2020, we launched an appointment-based service to address this barrier. Level Up to College and Beyond is a combination of one-on-one -on -one Zoom appointments with a librarian to aid high school students in navigating the areas of paying for, applying for, testing for, and preparing for higher education. Um, we also host information sessions with organizations such as the College Foundation of North Carolina. And this has been one of our EFRA programs that has truly emerged during the pandemic and has flourished in a virtual world, in part because that is how young adults uh, seem to communicate best. Since we launched Level Up during the pandemic, we've been fortunate to connect with our target audience through outreach and partnerships with local schools and civic groups. Next slide. Our focus in serving adults in areas of greatest need is bridging the gap in digital and information literacy. We offer an appointment-based service called Get That Job, which provides one-on-one -on -one assistance from a librarian on everything from navigating job sites to resume review. This moved to Zoom during the pandemic and has maintained success throughout. And because we recognize we're not experts at everything, the adult piece specific to EFRA locations has largely been about information and referral. Until last year, we partnered with the North Carolina Pro Bono Resource Center, offering free limited legal counsel during monthly drop-in sessions at our Ask a Lawyer programs. And we also partnered with a local organization to offer free classes on attaining U.S. citizenship. Next slide. Barriers to literacy can pre present themselves differently, and it's worthy to note we've made efforts to eliminate barriers faced by exceptional audiences. Sensory Storytime in non-pandemic times offers our youngest exceptional patrons an experience designed to engage but not overwhelm. Fidgets, visual cues, and adjusted light and sound enhance the program, and we also cap attendance at a lower number. Next slide. Now we'll turn it over to Anne. Um, so I'm going to talk a little about awareness. I think, you know, one of the things libraries struggle with, as I said, is people do not always understand what library service exists and how those library services can benefit their lives. So when Wake County, when we were thinking about this, um, instead of just focusing on um, customers, we really worked on identifying four primary stakeholders that had the potential to be barriers to what to our awareness. And we took this broader view because awareness with these four stakeholders was really necessary for our long-term success. So they, they fall into two groups. Next slide. And really they are internal and external. So internally, we've got um, library customers and library staff and external, we had non-users and funding authorities. Next slide. So we have had great success with our library customers and our funding authorities. You know, with our library customers, a lot of that is we have a we have a PR department with staffed with librarians. So they have a clear understanding of the mission of the library and of library service. We've done a lot with social media. We find that, you know, if our customers are having a good time, they love to post on their own social media and that kind of gets their their friends into the library. So that's that's really worked well for us. We also have a software tool 
that allows us to look at library card use and target customers based on what they've checked out in the library or if what they've, you know, if they like picture books, then we'll market story time to them. So we we have done well with our customers. Our funding authorities, you know, we really, we have a board of commissioners, library commission and county administration, and we've been pretty successful. I think for a number of reasons. One, you know, we take every opportunity to kind of get out in front of the board of commissioners. So we're not just there when we're asking for um, budget. So they understand, you know, um, what we're trying to achieve. We celebrate our successes with them. Um, we have a library commission that advocates for us directly to the board of commission. So those two groups we've done really well with. I think where we have some opportunities for growth um, really are non-users and library staff. So with non-users, our county is big and we grow by 100 residents per day. So um, often we, we struggle with how to get the word out to, to these um, groups. You know, we've hired a PR firm and had very limited success. Um, we've tried you know um, um we have a mobile app we've tried texting and it, it it had some success but i tell you i think one of the things that works well with us is partnerships you know when we can identify a partner that's working and trying to serve a population we're trying to serve and that certainly has helped us with the program every family ready to achieve that um sarah told you about with the library staff, uh, you know, a decentralized system is is wonderful if you live in the county because libraries are all over the county. But it is a very large staff without a central library, and so you know we are really working to get the word out to what we're trying to achieve, what we're what the library is trying to um, to do. And sometimes that's difficult when you have so many, you know, staff all spread out over 861 square miles. You know, we've done some, you know, basic things, newsletters. Uh, you know, when we did the late fee free program, it was we had a very successful um, transition. Uh, but what we found is sometimes the old fashioned just going out and meeting with staff has been more successful than some of the uh, you know, certainly the newsletters or uh, some of those other ways. Or we, you know, another thing we've done is coffee with the directors. And since we've been doing everything virtual, it actually it's even been a little easier to be in touch with at least library managers because it's easier when people don't have to drive to a central location for a meeting. So we're making progress, but um, we still have room to grow. Next slide. Uh, so this was what we added for this presentation, because I think, you know, uh, COVID-19 was something that nobody saw coming and uh, it had such an impact on uh, libraries. And so Sarah and, and uh, Katrina are going to tell you about some of the things that we did. I think, you know, one way that we were able to really get on this journey and not deviate or try and do things that um, did not really uh, um, meet our mission and reinforce our mission is we really did look at what kind of experiences we could develop that would reflect the different comfort levels of library customers. And so that's what they're gonna tell you a little about now. Um, this is Sarah, everyone. As Anne mentioned, uh, we did create a tiered system of service that reflects our customers' comfort level. And the following slides reflect the journey and our approach to eliminating barriers to, barriers to service created by the pandemic. Next slide. Uh, well, we started initially uh, in March of 2020 with our virtual library uh, because we didn't have a dedicated virtual library and didn't know really what the future held. We quickly shifted resources from our print book budget to e-content and as Katrina mentioned, eased restrictions on card registration so that people could get access to their library anytime. 
We launched Storytime Anytime so that children could enjoy a new programming experience from home every Saturday. And in April of 2020, when we realized the pandemic would be with us for a while, we transitioned our entire summer at the library experience to virtual. Next slide. And then at the same time, we started thinking about what contact-free services we could provide to be able to get books into the hands of our users. Um, and as we did this, we looked back to our drive time data that I referred to earlier in determining which locations we could offer our books on the go service from. So this is a contactless pickup service that we began in June with the goal of getting books back into the hands of our users. We were originally unable to start this service at all of our locations due to our staffing levels. 110 of our staff were supporting the county's emergency operations by serving as contact tracers but reviewing drive times has informed decisions of where we needed to start this service. With our circulation and usage numbers, we, know, we knew that a contactless pickup model would be very popular among our users. We took time to ensure that the system we created would be able to scale up to the need. In July, our first full month of books on the go at our regional libraries, library patrons scheduled over 44,000 appointments and checked out over 130,000 items. Knowing that searching the catalog for and requesting the volume of picture books that kids can consume in a week can be daunting for parents, we also launched kids book bundles during the pandemic. This allows parents to request a, a bag of 10 or 20 books for their children, which can also be picked up in a contact free way. Both books on the go and kids book bundles help improve our accessibility and allow patrons to access our print materials within their comfort range. And now I'll pass this back over to Sarah to talk briefly about express service. Thank you. Um, our 30 minute express service is quick and convenient as you would hope during the pandemic, people are in and out within 30 minutes. Uh, we've eased access to our collection and programs allowing customers to safely reconnect with their public library. To encourage browsing and impulse buys, we've adopted a bookstore model with tons of face out displays in the shelves and our tables are laden with multiple copies of bestsellers so that people can just grab something and go. To recreate the feeling of attending a library program, we've moved to an on the go model of putting everything you need in a bag to take home. For young children, this includes themed books and a sheet of songs, rhymes and finger plays all based on every child ready to read. Um, uh, talking, singing, reading, writing, and playing. And for school age, children get craft supplies, book recommendations, and activity sheets. We also offer a teen craft on the go and an adult craft on the go. So there is truly something for all ages. All three levels of service, virtual, on the go, and express, continue to expand based on evaluation and feedback from staff and customers. Next slide. So just to recap, um, today our learning our outcomes were to help you identify potential barriers to library use in your community, find and develop solutions to barriers, and consider alternative policies, operations, and programming initiatives that may decrease barriers. We did this by applying our methodology for decreasing barriers, which includes determining your library's priorities, identifying barriers that impact priorities, and then performing a gap analysis. So that is the end of our presentation, but we have about 12 minutes left for questions. Um, so I hope you've been sending those through and um, we'll be happy to answer. And of course, this is our contact information if you have any specific follow-ups you'd be interested in. Yes. Thank you. Um, thank you all for um, for that all of that information. And I do have several questions for you. Um, the first two refer to the, the vulnerability index. Um, the first one was how does one get this awesome vulnerability index graph and how did you generate the vulnerability index map? Sure. So um, we worked very closely with our partners in Wake County government, um, with our GIS department specifically, who applies demographic census data to maps for a variety of projects. So depending on the size of your community, you may have these resources available to you as well um, within your town government, county government, potentially even in your state government. Um, that is definitely something that we would not have been able to do just inside the library with our own resources. 
Thank you. Do you know if it's um, what they were looking at is related to the CDC social vulnerability index? And I was searching to find something to share. That was one that came up and you might not um, know the data they use. I'm not, I'm not familiar with the CDC's a vulnerability index in general. Um, I mean, that that is something that the CDC CDC may have, mm -hmm. um, but typically it looks at a variety of different vulnerabilities within a population. So CDC may have specific health vulnerabilities that they're looking at, um, but there's a lot of different ways that you can look at that information. And we really wanted to look specifically at um, some income information mm -hmm. because that really tied in with what we were trying to achieve. Awesome, thank you. Um, oops, I get to get back my, to my questions. Um, the next one refers to the programming that you were talking about um, with the young adult EFRA program. Uh, the question is, did you have to hire specialists? Uh, for example, your young adult EFRA program seems to require a high school guidance counselor background. So did you hire extra staff? Um, the, these special programs seem very time consuming. I can answer that one. Um, this is Anne. So uh, we hired a consultant to um, support us in um, developing our um, level up program. Primarily what we needed a consultant for was to um, one, help us get into the schools. Uh, Cause I know, you know, all libraries struggle with um, trying to build partnerships with their public school system. And we have a very big public school system. And she was able to, um, kind of identify different organizations in Wake County that and in North Carolina that supported kids, especially first generation kids in their uh, launch to college. And they provided training for our librarians. Uh, much, you know, this training was uh, primarily done. Um, some of it was virtual, some of it was in person, but um, that was the only program that we've used uh, that we've gone outside uh, our library organization uh, to hire somebody and um, it was a uh, it really was because we just you know I think what we felt like is generally every day our librarians got were and I'm sure your library you know librarians in all public libraries were informally supporting kids in their launch to college, you know, whether or not they're coming in and asking, can you help me with the FAFSA form? Uh, can you help me uh, with, you know, my, how could I write a better college essay? What are some books on that? So what we, and you know, can you help me with this college application or what books would help me? And so we really just took something we did informally and formalized it. Uh, so we could give better service to these kids, but we could also provide our librarians um, more information on what these kids were asking about so they were more comfortable. Um, I will, and I am going to let Sarah can talk to you a little about the um, other teen effort programs that um, we've done. Sure, um, I can talk a little bit about life hacks at the library. Uh, we did not hire a consultant for that one. That actually came out of, I think, a, a Yalsa uh, session uh, with um, trying to come up with really great hands-on ways to offer teens uh, a myriad of, um, of life skills in a sneaky way, kind of like how you sneak vegetables into desserts for young children. We wanted to <laughs> offer teens, um, you know, a way to sort of uh, figure out their cooking skills skills, figure out their financial management, figure out decision making, critical thinking, all through, um, you know, games and interactive sessions and um, those types of things, role playing games. So what we did really is just create a program in a box for each one of these 12 experiences so that we could pass them around between EFRA libraries and the librarian did not have to recreate the wheel. When I say it was a program series, I truly mean that we had 12 programs that we shared around 10 EFRA library locations. Uh, and so the librarians knew exactly what they were getting, when they would get it and how the program worked. So we really tried to do a lot of the legwork ahead of time to make this as seamless an implementation as possible. 
I did want to chime in really quickly to say that I have put a link in the chat to our Level Up LibGuide, which is also public facing. So anyone who visits the Wake County Library website can access this information. But Anne mentioned we hired a consultant for Level Up, which is true, but our librarians really did a lot of legwork to gather together that information in a really beautiful and cohesive way. A lot of things that your professionals are probably already doing, resources they might already be using, we just put it together and packaged it in such a way that it really does create a beautiful resource. Then we combine that with those one-on-one -on -one appointments to really offer that extra level of, of service. Thank you. Um, and I um, did copy that into the chat for everyone. Um, so thank you for thank sharing you. that with us. <clears throat> Um, and a comment came in, um, you mentioned um, that 100 uh, babies are born um, every day in Wake County. And earlier today, we had a, uh, our opening session was with Dr. Depeshnov Saria, who has a, um, uh, so the comment was that you should market through the hospitals where the babies are born. Um, and you might already do this, <laughs> but I wanted to share um, <clears throat> Reach Out and Read, which is a program that, um, Dr. Navsaria started, um, and other people can tell you more about it, and I'll put the link in, um, in the chat where they work with doctor's offices and pediatricians and whatnot to uh, make a prescription for reading. So I thought that was a good um, connection to uh, that comment that Candy made about marketing to the hospitals where the babies are born. Yes, thank you so much. Mm -hmm. Let me get to that uh, link here and put that in the chat. Um, so any other questions um, that anyone has? And I um, was ex interested to hear your uh, the changes that you have made since um, COVID-19. Um, are your buildings back partially open? Or are you still doing everything curbside and contactless? And um, what's your current current status of the libraries? Hey, Katrina, did you want to take that one? Sure. So. Um in the fall we piloted opening one of our libraries so that we could test out all of our safety protocols um, all of that express library service that sarah referenced um, and after testing it there for several weeks we were able to make a few tweaks and then open up all of our regional libraries our regional libraries are our largest facilities and um, just this month we have started opening our smaller libraries with the same safety protocols, including capacity and flexis and mask requirements um, and a health screening for anyone entering the facility. And as of this coming Friday, all of our facilities that are not currently under renovation will be open. So we're, we're excited to be able to offer that back to the community. Um, they have really missed the service that we provide in person. And, um, you know, for a lot of people, they they can't just go buy a book or um, you know find another place to go use a computer. So it, it really has pointed out how critical we are in the community. Mm -hmm. um, so we're we're very grateful to be able to be open and providing them service again. Yes, thank you. Um, I appreciate hearing where you're at, and I know so our libraries um, are interested in hearing that as well. We have libraries in a variety of um, open stages. Some are partially open, or um, some are still doing curbside and contact lists mm -hmm. and whatnot. So it's interesting to hear what's going on um, out in North Carolina. So thank you for sharing that. Yeah, and something that was important to us is uh, even when we opened our doors and invited the community back into our facilities, we wanted to make sure that we still offered our curbside service so that we could um, we could invite people to use the library at whatever their comfort level was. So we still have our books on the go service and people still use that if they're not comfortable coming into the library. Mm -hmm. Excellent. Do you think that, um, and this is kind of a personal question, I, I've been thinking about the services that um, libraries have provided and how they've changed and adapted during the um, pandemic and which of those services might remain partly because of accessibility. It might be, you know, easier for some people to, you know, do the um, the books on the go or the contactless um, pickups. You know, is that something that you would consider continuing uh, beyond the pandemic or is that um, you'll kind of wait and see? I think that's absolutely a conversation we'll continue to have. We haven't made firm decisions on that, but um, so much of what we have started doing during the pandemic, I see, I see a real benefit to our community. Um, and so, yeah, those will be ongoing conversations we have. 
Interesting. We might have to have you back sometime to find out what's going on next. <laughs> <laughs> Um, well, we are just about out of time. Um, so I just want to thank you so much, Katrina, Anne, and Sarah, for a great presentation. Oh, thank you. Thank you so much for having us. Thank you. Yes, thank you. It's, uh, it was awesome. Um, as, as I mentioned um, in the chat, the session recording and the slides will be posted on the conference website uh, by Friday, January 29th. There will be a short survey on your screen after we end today, and it will also be emailed to you. We really appreciate your feedback. Um, so thank you again for joining us today. This is our last session for today. We will begin at 9 a.m. tomorrow with tracks in both marketing and in public services. So thanks everyone for joining us. Thank you.